Very good. All right. Clock's ticking. I got 78 minutes and about 82 slides. Let's get back into it. Awesome. Okay. Hey, welcome. Quick shout out. I want to thank Scott Caulfield and the rest of the NSCA for putting on such a great event. This is a PR, a personal record. I think we have over 1,200 coaches here and it's outstanding. It's a great opportunity for me to come up to this stage because I am a strength coach and I work with nutrition. How many of you do the same? Okay, very good. There's a lot of us. And something I've learned along the ropes of coming through this field as a strength coach is it's not about reps and sets, it's about behavior change. Would you agree? Everything we do and how we create culture, whether we're taking a losing program from nothing and turning it into something. All right, Coach Brett Bartholomew, we talked about it earlier today. Kids will do things to us, but they've kind of got those fingers crossed behind us. What are they doing outside of that? If we've got stipulations of mandatory time, eight hours or 20 hours, how can we create habits for long lasting change. And so I'm gonna use my experience of coaching for the 10 plus years and how we can tie it into nutrition and go over some quick and easy strategies on how we can build this together. All right, so as further ado, let's keep rolling. Now I did update the slides. If you're on the guidebook, get rid of it. It's completely different. I want you to go ahead and take a snapshot of this. I actually gave you the Wi-Fi password. Scott hooked it up, so it's NSCA Coaches. That's the Wi-Fi. The password is CC, so Coaches Conference 2017, Nashville, Tennessee. All right, put that in if you go to precisionnutrition.com slash athlete dash centered dash coaching. Put your email in, you will get today's updated slides right away. So I'm gonna leave that up for about another 10 seconds. Also, I'm a very big fan of giving back to the community of coaches. They've continued to do that to us. So if, hey, if I say something, if something resonates with you, throw it on social media. There's a lot of coaches that couldn't be here, a couple members from my staff at RIP that are holding down the fort. So if we can go ahead and educate those that aren't here with us, that's gonna help us out. All right, so precisionnutrition.com slash athlete dash centered dash coaching. Brief background, how am I here? 10 years of experience of coaching and strength conditioning. I was a division three athlete at Springfield College. I interned at University of Connecticut. That brought me to the US, uh, US Olympic Training Center. From there, I went to Arizona State, took my first GA at the Citadel down in South Carolina, took a restrictive earnings into a full-time position at University of Louisville for two seasons, become the youngest head strength coach for the 119th ranked Division I football program in the nation at the time. So we talk about building something from scratch, a few ideas about that. That shot me up to the NFL for a quick one year. Then that brought me down for the last five years where I've been the most happiest, five years of director of sports performance at Reach Your Potential Training, I got RIP.com, and then now within the last year and a half, full-time with Precision Nutrition. I've coached a lot of athletes, so have you. I've seen a lot of things that have worked and a lot of things that haven't worked. And what I wanna go ahead and showcase today is our approach with coaching, whether it's a new recruiting class or a transfer or somebody that comes in they wanna walk on. How are we, we can develop these habits of nutrition as well as strength conditioning and apply that so we get the results that we are looking for. So what are the goals? There is a difference between coach and athlete-centered coaching. A lot of us do coach-centered coaching without even realizing it because that's in our nature. We're gonna recognize awesomeness over awfulness-based coaching strategies because there are a few derivatives from that. I want you to understand the motivation, all right, and the psychology process behind change. If change was easy, would we have jobs as strength conditioning coaches? No, right? Athletes get signed up, I'm gonna play lacrosse, I'm gonna go to this school, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Awesome, you're good to go. We don't need a strength coach, you're already fit, you're already strong, you know what you're doing with your nutrition, you're a great kid. We're in the business of behavior change. And then lastly is we want to develop a sustainable and successful habit-based nutrition program. It's the new year. How many of us said we were going to do something different? Raise your hands. It's 2017. Do you have a New Year's resolution? Do we have this outlandish goal that, hey, by the end of next year, by the time I come to coaches next time, I'm in great shape? How can we break it down to make it manageable and sustainable? And what can we do from our practicing as strength conditioning coaches to develop that plan? So I want you to think back. I want you to remember when, when there was a time you had a coach that you know exactly, right? We're laughing. Maybe it was your dad. Maybe it was your little league coach. Maybe it was somebody who told you to do something because that's what they wanted. I'm a young father now, four and two years old, seeing a lot of interactions with my kids playing youth sports. I gave a shout out to one of my coaches. I said, hey, you're doing, I coach a lot of kids. You're doing a really nice job with my son. I really appreciate that. I know it's tough. You got two-year-olds running around, four-year-olds running around, gymnastics right at this class. I got a snack break over here. No, don't bring the snack out. It's all crazy, okay? But what about that one coach that just that didn't make you feel great? Maybe he missed a rep on a squat and he let you know about it. Maybe he called you out in front of the team. Maybe you were supposed to do something and it just didn't fit the mold in that very moment. How'd that make you feel? 
And then I want you to think about maybe you had a really great experience. A guy like Coach Belisle, 2014 Little League World Series. You guys familiar with this video? Okay. Goes in there, Rhode Island, crushing it, representing the country, and they lost. But he didn't go in there, he didn't dog cuss them. He let them know how proud he was. A few years ago, Joe Ehrman came and talked about transformational coaching. What can we use from our experiences as former athletes, as current colleagues, mentors in this field, and as coaches to develop this model that we're looking for? So you've got that one experience, or maybe somebody if you battled body composition issues. Don't eat this, avoid this, limit this, stop this. And then maybe you had another type of coach that changed things a little bit for you. All right, so what is the difference? The difference is really the focus. What is the agenda that we're talking about right now? If I'm a strength coach and I write my program and I take pride in developing a 12-week cycle or 16-week or incoming freshman program, awesome, and I tell my athletes what to do, is it the best interest in their heart and our program in the long run? So if we look at coach-centered coaching, now you can apply this towards management, you can apply this towards nutrition, which is what we're gonna talk about, you can apply this towards writing your programs and communicating with your athletes. So step one, coach-centered is doing what our sport coaches tell us to do. How many times have we had sport coaches sit us down in the end of the year meeting and saying, this person's too fat, this person needs to gain weight. I love working with a football coach and they say, this guy's gotta weigh 211 pounds. And I'm like, what the hell does 211 have to do with this? Where did you come up with this number? Honestly, like I really would like to know. But when you're a young coach and you're working for a coach, not with a coach, you're like, you got it, absolutely, I've done it. I had coaches tell me explicitly what they want to weigh, what they should look like, and I was too young to figure out, hey, is this in the best interest of our athletes? Is this is what you want? So I know it's a challenge as a young coach, but as coaches, when we're working with nutrition changes and culture, how can we make sure it's best for our athletes? Well, we can ask some questions. That's what we're going to explore today. Number two, we're going to force our athletes to change suddenly and drastically. Think about when you went to college. How many of us were a college athlete? Raise your hand. A lot of us. Do you remember what that was like when you got there? New friends, new environment, new social situations, new expectations. Hell, I was recruited by the head coach. I thought I was in. And then all of a sudden, my offensive coordinator calls me, and I'm like, who's this guy? Well, it turns out he's going to be the most important figure in my life the next four years. I had to change really quick. So we can force our athletes to change, like give them a diet plan saying, here, this is what we have to do, or we can take it slow. A big component of this is meeting our athletes where they're at, and then setting these realistic goals. We'll do an after action review meeting with our athletes at the end of the season. Hey, how do you feel about this? We're looking back, looking ahead. What do you think is going on? Coaches will come in, yeah, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, awesome, we're feeling great about it. Is it realistic? I hadn't really trained until I got to Springfield College and I just blew up. Body weight too. You talk about the freshman 15, I put on the freshman 50, 5-0. That was a lot, that was a big change for me. So I'm hitting all these numbers, coach is like, what are your goals? I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and squat 500, I'm gonna bench 400, and he's like, easy guy. All right, you just, you just started, this isn't really realistic, so what's more manageable? So that's an athlete-centered approach. So think about that when we're addressing nutritional changes. Making their success about us. You've seen it on the interwebs, you've seen it on Twitter and Instagram, right? Coaches are gonna take credit for all these bowl games, but are they taking credit for the injuries too? And when you raise above and above and you continue to climb in this field of coaching, losing aspects and losing games to injury becomes that much more real. But it's not about us. This is not about our transformational journey. I'm in the private sector now, we're not putting up, start with me, insert photo of a Sunday Republican newspaper here on day zero, and then 12 weeks later, this, and say, it's because of us. No, it's because of them. So great coaches understand that. It's their journey, it's not about us. You have to give credit where credit is due, that's the athlete-centered approach, and we wanna make sure that we're not pushing athletes into the back seat of their process of change. This is their road, this is their car. We're kinda just hanging out and like riding shotgun last night, all right? Get an Uber, get in a Lyft. Right? Who's ever sitting shotgun, you're kind of doing the most interacting. Let's sit back a little bit. Instead of telling our kids how to change their diet, what to fix, what they should change, why don't we spend time sitting with them and talking about it? Now, I know this is very difficult. We've got demands from the NCAA. We've got issues that we can't work with. But we can build this into our plan appropriately and long-term base. So one thing that comes to mind is 
Something like this. Coach says we need to talk about your diet. I've said this to an athlete. This athlete might be completely oblivious to what's going on. Rather than saying this, why don't we say, hey, I'm just kind of curious, how are you feeling out there? Maybe an athlete comes back from winter break and they clearly put on some LBs. Maybe they're not moving too well. But all of a sudden, if we just force them into that magnifying glass of, hey, we've been keeping an eye on you and we're not liking what we're seeing, we might have some issues. It's the same question, I'm just framing it differently. All right? Or, hey, just do what I say. This is what we like to do. Write the program, do this. Hey, I need a meal plan, I need to gain weight, I need to lose weight, just do this. We don't have time to deal with that because I've got to write another cycle. I've got to go work with another team. For what? What is the basis of this change that we're looking to accomplish? So just do what I have to do or, hey, what do you think we should do here? Running a private facility has been very difficult growing from seven athletes to now we're seeing almost 1,000 athletes per year. It's been great. We've had to grow staff. And if you're a manager, if you're a head coach, a director, you've got to let go of the reins. It's very easy for us to do things because we've done it so many times, it's repetition. But why don't we change it and say, hey, listen, instead of me just doing it, let's sit down real quick. Let's do this together. What do you think we should do? How should we change this? You have an idea for a speed drill? Cool, let's go through this. Instead of being like, no, that's the way we've always done it, that's the way we're gonna continue to do it. And then lastly, I get this a lot, I don't know what to eat after practice. So there's a basis of we have to accomplish this nutritional knowledge, we have to educate our kids. We'll ask them, hey, what do you think would be a good choice here? We are doing our kids a disservice by giving them the answer all the time. And when you're a parent, you realize that. If a kid falls, you rush and pick them up right away. I'm not saying let them bleed out there, okay? But there has to be this element of how are you gonna respond? When the weight is heavy and it's on your back, what are you gonna do? When your number is called, what's gonna happen? How can we reframe that? To truly live, to truly coach, to truly make a difference in our kids' lives. Let's ask more instead of telling. Telling is easy. Telling is saying, let's, you're out of my way, get out, I got a next group, I gotta come in. Hey, let's ask them, and then we're gonna see them again in season lift, I'll see you in two days or three days. Or if you're traveling with them, hey, spend time with them at training table, spend time with them at dinner. Just don't take your per diem and then hit it. Build this, it takes repetition, it takes culture, it takes an opportunity to know your athletes when you're developing habit-based coaching, okay? Because we understand that the struggle is real. We talked about it earlier. There's a lot of things happening with them. It's hard for us because coaches tell us what to do. Maybe this is sport coaches. Maybe this is administration. We feel like we have to do this. Our jobs are on the line. Whether it's high level division one, division two, division three, high school coach, volunteer coach, we feel this pressure that we have to get results. And so I empathize, I understand the struggle. And I feel it more than ever now being in the private sector because if they don't get results, they don't sign up. But more importantly, if they don't enjoy the process and learn, they won't sign up. They have to enjoy the experience. So are you the coach that just says, take this, do this, and if you don't make it, you don't lose weight, you don't gain weight, it's your fault? Or are you gonna be the coach that takes the time or delegates somebody to take the time? and saying, we're gonna figure this out. This is important to you, this is important to me because you're part of this team. And guess what, your team pays my bills. So we're gonna get this, because we're all part of this. It is real. We feel this struggle, we have awfulness-based approach, which we might be used to because we're coaches. And one of the biggest things that coaches do is they correct. I've worked very hard and tirelessly to fix when I walk into the facility, not to look at what's left out. You know what I'm talking about? You're the first one, who, who works the 6 a.m. morning groups? Raise your hands, who's been there, all right? And you walk in, you just know, med ball's out, minivan on the rack, squats at J-hook, set five, should be set up for bench. It's just ingrained. We look for what's wrong. You're coaching Olympic lifts. There's always something wrong with the Olympic lifts. Always. Too far out, too far close, double hinge, all this, no shrug, chin's over there. You're looking this way and that's looking like a reverse curl, starfish catch. It always happens. But do we take the time to say, hey, <laughs> I really like that. We're gonna focus on this next but that was a really good job. So off on this, we're just pointing out everything that's wrong. Food logs, I'll use an example later. Or we can take this awesomeness-based approach and say, all right, let's, let's roll through this. Because we've got time, we've got time. Stop saying you don't have time. It's an excuse, it's a cop-out. We can build this into our culture of a high-performance program with nutrition coaching. So what is off on this base coaching? Our athletes are broken. This is something that happens a lot, especially when they come onto campus the first time. 
Maybe they're overweight. Maybe they don't know how to eat. Maybe they have an eating disorder issue. And obviously there's a lot of things that we're not gonna be able to talk about out that are outside of our scope of practice, but as strength condition coaches, look at your CSCS and your basic responsibilities. It talks about nutritional education. I can't give somebody who's got a medical condition medical advice with nutrition, but I can reframe how I say things and build some habits and explore some options. So we have to look at, hey, they're not broken. Maybe they just don't know. Number two, their identity is flawed, so let's just force them into a new one. I got recruited to play tight end. I was like, yes, jacked, I'm gonna lose a bunch of weight. Broke my arm my senior year, dropped down to 220. First day, I introduced myself as a tight end, and they say, we're gonna move you to tackle. And I was like, oh. And if you've been an offensive lineman, I've embraced it now, but that's like, oh, really? I go from like catching the ball to not even looking at the ball. Coach is like, don't even look at the ball. Like, that was tough. That was a new identity for me. I didn't want to be that. So this can happen with position changes, or if you're hiring or managing a staff, hey, this person's out, he took a job elsewhere, you've got to step in. And then now you're like, oh, I'm the basketball guy, or I'm the lacrosse coach, and what do I do now? The real trick is to figure out what's the identity behind that. But it's not broken, it's not flawed. Let's help them figure out what works best in their situation. Because we are a results-driven profession, we have to understand that we are looking for results. But is it always wins and losses? Is it always injuries? Is it about the people that they'll become and the habits that they'll accomplish? So awesome base. I love the work of John Gordon all the way to the bottom. All right, if we have great events and we give that positive energy, we bring the juice, we're gonna have great outcomes. So when we look at awesomeness based coaching, when we're looking at food logs, we're turning up the good. We're kind of like blocking out the suck stuff. I got a food log sent to me yesterday by one of my high school athletes. He is a four and a half star recruit in New Jersey. All he wants to do is play at the next level. And I'm looking at his food log and I see pizza. I see a sandwich called the Joey. I don't even know what the Joey is. Do you know what the Joey is? Apparently it's like slamming, right? Cause he had it three days in a row. Didn't eat breakfast, but you know what? He had a fruit and kale shake. And I was like, where did this come from? But right away I'm like circling and crossing out like pizza and this and that. But I was like, you know what? Hey man, this is nice. How can we do more of this? Think about your athletes when you're looking at things like food logs, or you're talking to them about nutrition, whether it's individual or group based. What are the things that we're already doing really well? And how can we do more of that? That's an awesomeness based approach right there. We have to highlight and build upon the bright spots. We're gonna talk about motivation later. Okay, Chip and Dan Heath. We wanna focus on this we versus me approach versus guiding and pushing. If we do it together, I'm helping you guide. I'm your collaborator. If I'm your coach, and I just tell you it's about me and I'm gonna push you to do something, we're gonna run into some issues long term. Now, not everything's gonna be synonymous with strength conditioning, but what we have to understand is that it is pretty similar. Our approach with our athletes is probably pretty similar with maybe how we treat our staff, which is how we treat our spouses and our kids, if you're parents. Is it about us or is it about them? That's the dying question I want you to figure out and understand. And if you haven't added another book to your great reading list, Pick up the coaching habit. Seven questions to make you a better coach. It's saying less and asking more is a huge addition to nutrition coaching moving forward. So I addressed it earlier. Think about going to college. Who really had an awesome roommate their freshman year? Raise your hands. Like your BFFs, you're in their wedding. How many of you were like, yep, I'm out. I need to get a new one. A lot of us. I was going for practice and he was coming in at 6 a.m. I'd come back, Domino's boxes all over the place. I squinty, right? That's a tough adjustment. Then you have rules or you don't have rules. You've got a new team, you've got a new coach, living quarters. And we all know college campus food is really awesome, okay? You've got a new schedule. You have a support system or you don't. But the real issue is the expectation to fit in. Man, that's tough. So that's getting there and when you're there, you've got to win now. You've got to excel, you've got to perform, you've got to pay for classes. You may have to work third shift. You may have to do internships. You gotta make mom and dad proud because we all know how much money they're paying because they continually tell us, right? But in college, we, don't, we, we forget about that sometimes because we're not working with parents a lot. We see them in the recruiting visits, we see them on family and friends weekend, maybe we see them on homecoming, right? We probably jumped a kid for coming in late a few times. 
And then you jump that one kid and then you find out something really deep happened. And now you're like, you know what, I'm gonna take a minute and I'm gonna re-explore that when I can. There's a lot of things that can happen with this nutrition model as well. We want them to study, we want them to have fun, and we want to continue to move forward. So how do we get them motivated? How often do athletes come to us and they're like, I'm too fat, or I need to lose some weight, or I've got to put on some muscle, I don't want to get pushed around next year, versus how many times do coaches tell us what they need to do? It's a staggering difference, would you agree? Coaches are telling us what they think is best for their athletes, and we're going to respect them and we're going to honor that, but we are the missing link right there. We go from coach to support coach, sport performance coach, strength coach, assistant AD, whatever we're calling ourselves these days, to athlete. Their message to the athlete, who's in the middle? Us. So how do we get them motivated? Is it really going to be this easy? Do it! Just do it! Yes, you can! Just do it! If you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. Wait for it, wait for it. <sighs> Clearly Shia LaBeouf doesn't lift, right? <laughs> but think about this, how many Monday motivations do we send out? How many text messages at 5 a.m., conquer the day, win the battle, crush life, trample the weak, hurdle the dead, do this. We slap each other, we get some nose torque under the squat bar, let's go. What about nutrition? It's hard to get jacked up to eat some salmon and green beans, am I right? That's hard. And we may think that's healthy, because it is. But what do you do with an athlete who never grew up around that? So we start talking about socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. This is where we get into where are we meeting our kids? And where is the process of change evolving? All right, Walking Dead fans, anybody raise your hands? Okay, a little bit more than usual, that's good. Who's this guy up here, anybody know? Morgan. So about season six, episode four, there's an episode. <laughs> you gotta love Netflix, just straight binging, right? There's something going on with Morgan. There's a little PTSD, and I won't spoil the whole series for you, but in any case, when you're watching something that deals with zombies, here's a quick clue. There is something somebody needs to get, and zombies are in the way. That's all you gotta know, okay? So there's something that these people need to get, and there's zombies in the way. So Morgan's having a hard issue, and the episode is talking about here is not here. This is the episode title. He's here in the world, but is he really living? It's a tough world right now. Ask yourself, because they're a Division I athlete, are they really a Division I athlete? How many times have we seen athletes come in, and they've never lifted? They look shredded. They've got 7% body fat, and they eat like junk. And then our media and social channels continue to extrapolate this and push this out. Because they're here, because they showed up, doesn't mean they're really here. Just because they show up for lift doesn't mean they want to be there. Would you agree? Just because coach said they need to lose weight doesn't mean they really want to. They don't understand that. So by taking this one extra step and figuring out why are you here, Simon Sinek talks about it, the five whys, we can adapt this accordingly. So just know that when we're working with nutritional changes, just because they signed up and you told them to show up so you can review a few things, doesn't mean they're really bought in. So we need to take our time with that. So now let's talk about our game plan, all right? So about 10 years ago when I started coaching, I'm 31 now, got out of college, relative intensity was like the big hit, all right? I did a lot of work with relative intensity and Prilipin charts. You know, I worked under Joe Ken for a number of years. I was just fascinated with the data. I wanted to take this approach. I wanted to be as detailed as possible. I just wanted an information spew. If a coach was like, hey, what are we gonna do? And I'm like, cool, I got this Excel graph sheet, boom, you got the charts and the little things and this is happening, we're gonna do data and questionnaires. Because my coach taught me, he was like, yeah, just put everything on there because they'll never second guess you. And I was like, hey, as a GA, that was pretty good advice. You didn't show up there with a Microsoft Word document saying, here's my plan, Times New Roman, size 12. You put out a chart. You figured out how to do some Excel functions. You made it look really fancy, and you made it a lot of pages. So they'll be like, yeah, it looks good. Thanks, coach. I got this. So how can we apply this? So I took this. Let's just look like we're doing a six-week performance plan. This is how we're going to target nutritional coaching now. Step one, our base cycle, is we want to clarify. We want to clarify what we're doing. We want to clarify what is important to our athletes. So we load it up. Step two, we're going to prepare them. How can we make sure that they're ready for this change? 
So now the weight's getting up a little bit higher. Step three, we're going to shape the path. We're going to direct the rider. We're going to support the elephant. We're going to do everything needed. Things are cranking up a little bit. Now we're really rolling. Step four, now we're going to focus. We do change. We love change. Change is the only constant. Change is the only thing that we can depend on in our career. You're changing jobs. You're changing weight rooms. You're changing logos. All right, there's a lot of us wearing different logos than we were last year. That's part of the business. What happens if we're changing too much and too fast? So we reached out, reached out, reached out. We're just about to peak. All right, let's talk about systems now. How can we develop a nutrition coaching system? And then lastly, we've got to take some time and let's review this. Let's go back. Let's look at our program. Hey, how did we do this year? Injuries, losses, motivation, culture, team. Let's go ahead and take the time to do that. Are you going back after this conference and meeting with your staff and reviewing what you've learned and what you picked up and who you met? There has to be that review process. All right, so let's get into it. How do we clarify exactly what our athletes want? Now, I like to attribute this to maybe like a movement screen. Some of us may do something like the functional movement screen. Uh, we might do something like the fundamental capacity screen. We might make our own screening. We may not believe in screening because we're just like, all kids are messed up anyway. Just squat them and we'll figure it out. It happens. I work with youth athletes. We have a very basic screen because they've never squatted. They've never benched. They've never done a plank. So to me, I feel it's a little unfair to just throw them into the fire and be like, awful, awful, go to physical therapy. I don't want you to go to physical therapy. I want to coach you. Coach said it earlier, don't regress it, just coach it. Coach it better. So clarifying is, is this type of assessment for me. So how do we do this? Something we explore in Precision Nutrition is about this like, concept of identity, values, and goals. All right? Identity. Questions that we ask our kids for nutrition. Or, let's say you're doing a preseason meeting. I'm the kind of athlete that. What type of identity do they associate themselves with? Notice, I don't want them to say, I'm the kind of athlete that plays lacrosse or lifts hard. I'm looking for those intangibles. We talk about recruiting, right? What are those intangibles that we can measure? How is this important to them? My teammates would describe me as, well, you know what? The coaches know that. Because if we associate ourselves with identity with a label or a role, like a strength coach or an NFL coach or a D1 coach, and we're no longer that, are we not ourselves anymore? If you're a parent, if you're a spouse, and you're no longer one of those two, who are you? Again, this is some deep stuff. You're probably not going to be able to get away with this with like your incoming freshman, but these are some things to consider. So we establish who they are and why this goal is important to them, losing weight, gaining weight, maintaining, improving their on-field body composition so they can go out there and crush it. Why is it valuable to them? So if we go, I'm the kind of athlete that takes pride in hard work and, and does what needs to be done for the team. It's important for me that my teammates understand I'm here for them. Now all of a sudden that one little goal that coach gave us for nutritional change, this means more to our kids because they don't want to let them down. As a former offensive lineman, it was very, very important that I kept my quarterback healthy. Very important. So I did things for the good of the team, for the better of the team. But if we just force change down their throat, we're going to set ourselves up for disaster. We focus on, so I need to make sure and I like to make time for. And then lastly, how does that go ahead and coincide with our goals? So I'd feel awesome if I accomplished X. You know what, it would be nice if I actually did this. And I've always wanted to. This is the big part right here. I've always wanted to. When was the last time we asked our kids what they wanted to accomplish? We take pride and they come back after a season and coaches bring them in there for athlete expectations, coaches' expectations. Hey, what do you guys want to accomplish right now? How is this important to you? And if we can find something for them, it makes the process change much easier, right? You have that athlete that comes in and they're like, I want to go to insert crazy amount of high level athletic performance after college. Whether that's professional, semi-pro, I want to play overseas. Do you find a little bit more intrinsic motivation with those athletes than others? Yeah, because it's their goal. It's their motivation. How can we build that within the nutritional context? If we don't know and we don't take this clarification, it's going through the maze and just hitting every roadblock. Oh, I thought you wanted this. Oh, no, I, I thought you knew how to do this. Nope, wrong. I want to get to the finish, but if I don't take time to explore how this is important to their identity, why they value this change, and what their goal really is, I will never make it from top left to bottom right. Because if we're not assessing, we're just guessing. We'll do that with weightlifting. We'll do that with movement mechanics. Why aren't we doing it with nutrition? Why are we assuming they don't know anything or they know everything, and we're just ignoring that?
Because out of 168 hours a week, let's say you get eight hours with them, there's a lot of time to mess that up. And you've probably seen that. And if you're only measuring things like body weight and it's only once a week, there's a lot of things that can go into affect that too. So let's re-explore this identity and let's clarify what's important to them and how can we make it important for them. And that comes in with the questioning process. So once we've assessed, now we get into our preparation model. So now we think of this as our warm-up. How do we prepare our athletes? The first thing is making sure that they're understandably ready for this change. And this was a very, very hard concept for me as a strength conditioning coach because what I found was that, guess what? We're getting paid to motivate. We get paid to coach kids to get better, to reach their potential both on and off the field. But you know what? If they're not ready, it doesn't matter how awesome we are. We can't force it on them. We've got the athletes that punch in and then they got punch out and then we've got those athletes that are just grinding and they're crushing it out there. So we have to understand that, are they ready? And a simple thing, we talked about questionnaires earlier, right? On a scale of one to 10, one being not at all to being 10, let's go now, let's do this. And here's what we found looking at a bunch of clients, 45,000 plus, 900,000 pounds of body fat loss over the last 10 to 15 years with PN. If they're not at a nine or higher, what we're asking them to do is too hard. We have to get them ready, willing, and able to accomplish and conquer the day. We would love to say, hey, we're living our life a quarter mile at the time. It's all gas and no brakes. But as coaches, what do we have to do? We're stress managers. We have to adapt. We have to shift gears. Have you ever written a weight on an athlete's card based off like the velocity of the last set? And you're like, oh, yeah, you got this. And then you get under it and get buried? Yes, you have. Don't lie. OK? And you're like, Yep, wasn't ready for that. Got a little ambitious. A lot of our New Year's resolutions don't stick because we're too ambitious. How can we make a habit, a nutritional habit, so easy that we won't mess up? Give me the first three things that you did when you woke up this morning. Yell them out. One of the, one of the first three things you did. You woke up, what next? Water. You got water. You brushed your teeth. What else? Checked your phone. Go to the bathroom. How many likes did I get last night? Right? Retweets, mentions, those are automatic. We, don't, we do it without even thinking. How can we build nutritional habits that are automatic? How can we get them ready? More importantly, how can we get them willing? Willing is a sign of confidence. Willing is getting them to believe that what you said, coach, I can do this. Absolutely, 100%. On a scale of one to 10, how willing are you to do this? Coach, you know what? You gotta, you gotta get this kid to lose a little weight. All right, so you give him this meal plan. And you're like, here you go, man. This is what you gotta do. And he's not willing to change. That's active resistance right there. Are you gonna force it down there and saying, if you don't change, if you don't make your weight, you're gonna run? All right, you put the carrot out in front of the stick, go, 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 go. How can we get them to be willing? If we're looking at getting under a squat bar, you can be ready, mentally maybe, but have you ever gotten under that bar and maybe as soon as you picked it up, you're like, mm-mm, <laughs> nope. Maybe more, sometimes more often than not. You got it, right? You got the music in the background, ACDC's blaring, let's do this. And then you just kind of grip it and you're like, oh, I don't know about this. But you're not gonna get out from under the bar and say, you know, you lost your confidence. You're willing to do it, but were you really ready? So we've got to tie those two in together. And then the last one I want to explore is, are you able? A lot of times when we give nutrition coaching, when we're talking to our teams, hey, try this, eat some protein here, work on your post-workout recovery shake, all right? Here's a recipe booklet. Here's a nice recipe guide. Here's a book that we did, we're fundraising. Here's everything you need to do to be healthy. Are they able to do that? Like, are they able to cook? What did you have in your freshman dorm room? Throw, throw me something. A microwave combo fridge, if you put down the deposit, or you bootlegged it and you just brought a mini fridge and duct taped the microwave on top of it because it was cheaper. You had a hot pot, right? Maybe you went on Pinterest and you saw a little designs. This is where I put my candy stash. My RA comes over. Maybe it was alcohol at the time. You just put a curtain over it. <laughs> this is what we're working with. But I'm asking you to reflect back on how you're approaching your nutrition coaching. Welcome to university. Here's your blueprint for success. Here's everything you need to be successful to be this type of athlete at this school. Are they going to read it? You're going to give him this big book and like, cool, well, I told you, coach, I told him. I gave him everything he needed. Great. Just because you're given the tools doesn't mean they're using them. So we have to establish its ability because, yeah, I'd love to see a mini fridge like that. Apples, carrot sticks. But you're going to see ice cream. You're going to see soda. You're going to see a lot of other things. 
And you're going to see things like this up here a lot more often than we give it credit for. So if we explore that and ask ourselves, are they ready for this change, this one little thing I'm asking them to do, are they even willing to do it? How many times do we tell our athletes, you got to go home and either stretch more, do some mobility, do some activation, here's some homework workouts. Has that happened before? I don't have enough time, so you got to do this on your own, especially if you're like a one-man show. I don't have time to do it, so do this on your own. And you just give them a nice little, I did a photo, a, a, pre a starting position, an ending position, reps and sets. I even shot a video and I put it on Vimeo. Of course they're going to do it. Are they? Are they ready, willing, and able? So whatever change you're trying to elicit, take the extra one to two minutes and give this to them on a scale of one to 10. Build this into your readiness questionnaire. That would be a nice challenge to see. So we've assessed. Now we're kind of warming up. So now let's get into the psychology. Let's get into this, this process of this behavior change. So now we're, we're trying to shape this path. The above di diagram is from Chip and Dan Heath's book called Switch. Circa about 2010. I know most of us have read it. If you haven't, I highly suggest you pick it up. Using this analogy right here about directing the rider and motivating this elephant and shaping the path is one of the biggest and easiest to understand when you're dealing with behavior change. Think about all the habits. Think about when you're getting that new athlete, all these ingrained bad movement patterns. The squat mornings, right? The salad bowl planks, right? Okay? They've been doing that over and over and over again. So all of a sudden you come in and it's like, it's my way or the highway. This is how we do things. It's going to take some time. So the Heath brothers explore this concept right here about the elephant. So step one, how do we do this? We're directing the rider. If you're looking at motivation, you're looking at the brain, the rider is your left side. It's your rational thinking side. It's your what we call the thinky brain. This is the side of the brain that gets overanalyzed, overused, forced again and again and again. Because what are they doing? If they're not lifting, they're sleeping or going to where? Class, hopefully. They're getting that all day already. So we continue to educate them. We continue to push handouts down their throat. We can continue to just do this and do that. And we're just forcing information on this left side of the brain. But in order to reach the left side of the brain, there are some superpowers that we have to explore. So step one is follow these bright spots. The left brain is good at analyzing. How many of us write our own program still as strength conditioning coaches? Raise your hands. You're training yourself, you're writing. Has anybody contracted it out? Raise your hands. A few. Does it feel good, Coach Smith? Yeah, it feels good, right? Because you've got this paralysis by analysis, right? One of the worst things I ever learned was how much weight I should do at a given percentage. I hated when my coach taught me that. Adam, what's 80%? And I was like, five? He's like, no, eight. So now every time I see 80%, I'm like, I didn't get eight. I suck at life. Follow the bright spots right here. Understand what they're doing really well, build on that. One of the best ways to elicit nutritional change is something called habit stacking. And there's a really quick, easy book online about it. But you find that one habit that's automatic, like brushing my teeth. What could I do on top of that? Take my multivitamin, all right? Or if I'm making my morning oatmeal and I'm making my eggs, what can I do at the same time? I can do a scoop of whey protein and get that from my post-workout shake. Stack habits on top of each other. Follow these bright spots. Once we can accomplish that, we understand the motivation. Step two, now we script the critical moves. This paralysis by analysis, we do very well with numbers. We love Excel, hopefully. We enjoy the process of number this. If I do this, will I get X result? But the left side of the brain wants this scripted, hey, this is how we're going to do things. And if you travel with a team, maybe you got something from your director of operations. We're on the buses by this time. We're eating lunch by this time. We're doing pregame by this time. There's a part of the brain with a lot of our athletes that enjoy that structure and systems. So let's build that. Because if we just tell the director rider, oh, I'll figure it out. I've done that a few times with interns. Who's done that? Figure it out. You'll, get, you'll figure it out. Right? I got one intern laughing right now about it. Just get it done. Find a way. Right? That's not the best way to approach things. So if I direct the rider, I script these critical moves, I give them their game plan. And then lastly, I point to the destination. It's so hard when you're working with nutritional change, I've got to lose X amount of pounds or I've got to gain X amount of pounds. And they just see the outcome and they're like, it's so far. They just keep focusing on the outcome. And if you're working with team sports, you have no control over wins and losses, right? It's play calling, it's field position, it's motivation. There's a lot of things behind it that we can't control, but what can we control? Show them where we're going, remind them where we're going, and allow them to understand the steps that we need to get there. So we focus on the behaviors, we focus on the processes. The outcome will take care of itself. 
So step one, make sure our rider, our left side of the brain, we understand what's ahead of us, what goal they have for nutritional change, and direct them accordingly. It's no different than bringing up your kids before lift. Hey, here we go, check out the script, this is what we got, A block, we got hang snatch, four sets of three, we're gonna pair that with some glute activation, get ready for squat. Got it, good, last set checked on me. All right, let's break it out, one, two, three, win. Script the moves, point to the destination. Hey, this is where we're going, it's gonna be hard today, it's gonna be a medium heavy day today. You're gonna grind a little bit or we're gonna watch your velocity because in a couple weeks this is what we're shooting for. So you may be a little tired right now, you may be hurting a little bit, but I need you to push through it, we're gonna be just fine. Give them a plan. Step one, direct the rider. Step two now, let's motivate this elephant. So the elephant now is an analogy of the right side of the brain. It's the primal, it's the motivational piece. It's the side that's very, very emotional and it's gonna do things based off instinct, all right? If your athletes are at the club and they get pushed, what's their first instinct probably gonna be? Probably kinda give them one of those, right? Like seriously, that just happened? Our instinct with reactive neuromuscular training, the band goes above the knees, the bands are getting pushed in, what does it force our bodies to do? Push out. It's instinct right away. But elephants kind of get freaked out a little bit. All right, they're very easily to get spooked. So we have to understand what is their why? Why is this change important to you? That's one of those seven great questions in the coaching habit. What is important about this for you? And if you can find that reason a little bit deeper, and maybe you ask why again, why? and why. Maybe it takes you two or three or four. You'll understand, hey, this, this really means a lot to that person. Because as we go through the ranks of coaching and we're interning and we're volunteering and we're taking a GA that only pays a stipend, all right, we've got a strong why. And I just talked with a coach earlier today and he's like, yeah, I left. I just woke up and just unmotivated. That's when you know that was probably too late to change. There are some warning signs. So with nutrition coaching, find their why. Why is this goal important to them? Is it a spring break thing? Like, are they just trying to get ripped for spring break? Cool, and then I'm just gonna have to deal with you again come summer one, and then we're gonna have this issue over and over and over again. So what happens if we can build some habits to take you to an ideal level of where you could be, plus or minus a couple pounds? You feel good, you look good, you're performing like great out there, man. You're really killing it. Now we have some wiggle room. So find their why. Step two, shrink the change. Again, on a scale of one to 10, if it's not a what, it's too hard. Nine. Think about it, nine is good, nine is great. Even an 8.5 and eight. Hey, I want you to go ahead and have a post-workout shake every single day. How, how ready do you feel about that? Oh yeah, I'm ready, I can do that, 10. Are you willing to do it? Yeah, that's it, 10. Are you able to do that? Eh, I commute and I just don't like leaving my shaker bottle inside my car all day. All right, so maybe it's not every day. Maybe it's two days a week. Maybe it's the days after you train. We're forcing things like breakfast and mandatory training tables down their throats. Maybe they are working third shift and that eight o'clock breakfast idea seemed like a really good idea for you but we didn't ask, what's going on? Hey guys, you know, we got some new meal plans happening, NCAA, we're trying to figure out some times, what works best for everybody's schedule? Again, you're at the higher level, you're gonna have to make some decisions, but we can work with that. So we have to learn to shrink the change. And then lastly is grow their confidence. We didn't take our athletes and just put on 405 and take it for a ride. And maybe you saw that one athlete that could. You probably started off with some bodyweight squats and some ISOs and block zero work. You worked into some assistive squats and maybe some box squats to get that range of motion. You grew their confidence. So now when it came test week, you were ready to go. Or you're teaching the Olympic lifts, you're starting off with base positions. Or speed work, body, posture, arm action, leg action. So why not do it with nutrition? We're gonna talk about two important words later, but show me is one of the two most powerful words we can use as coaches. Oh, I got that, all right, show me. You're not being a jerk about it. There's no sarcasm. Show me how you can do this. Then they're confident. All right, coach, what else you got next? Cool, all right, you did that little mobility circuit. Now, while you're doing a mobility circuit, let's go ahead and get that shake. Let's drink the shake while we're doing that. Can you do that? Awesome. Or maybe, you know what, we're trying to lose some body fat. Easy strategy, how do you feel about, you know, maybe cutting your starches in half and doubling your veggies when you eat dinner with the boys at night? You feel good about that? Yeah, I can do that. All right, show me, throw me a pick. Shrink the change, grow their confidence because like training, it's all progressive overload. Our changes with nutrition might be progressive overload. But if we throw all the overload right away and we just max them out, conjugate style, all the time, every time, they get burnt out. How many of us have family members that join the gym early on in the year? They wanna make changes, right? Oh, I did cardio for four hours, then I got a personal training session, I'm killing it, I'm doing this and that, I'm there like 20 hours a week, and then you see them like four weeks later and you're like, what happened? I did too much, too fast, too soon. So let's shrink the change and let's grow their confidence. 
Once I've directed the rider and I've motivated the elephant, now the most important part as coaches that we can control is shaping the path. Think about their environment. Do you work at a primarily a commuter school? Are they in their cars? Do they pass two fast food restaurants on the way to the weight room like they did when I was at the University of Louisville? So there was training table, and then there was Papa John's, and McDonald's, and then the weight room. What type of environment are you working with? Do you have somebody that's living off campus, senior housing? We take a lot of great pride in periodizing our programs for training age and maturity. What about nutrition? What happens if we focus on our basics with our new kids, and then as they got better and they bought in a little bit more, they did a little bit more, or you moved off campus, we tailored our nutrition coaching a little bit for them. That's what's happening when you're rising through the ranks of professional sports. I couldn't use the same exact strategies I did at a low-level Division I school when, to when I got to the NFL, because now they had private chefs. Now they had pretty much unlimited funds. They could buy whatever supplement they wanted. So I had to tailor that. So shaping their environment, most kids are putting on excessive amounts of body fat because they're not eating early and they're eating super late at night, combined with bad food choices. So let's explore that. How can we shape their environment? They're not gonna spend their time at the library all day, every day, but we can have a small hand in that. With this, we now build our habits. So we revisit, lose weight, gain weight, stay the same, feel better. What type of habits do we need with that program? If you think about you take an athlete and you're taking a four-year transformation within the coaching process, this is where we'd love to see you. This is what a, a Division I prospect looks, or if you work with a high school, this is what's needed. I can't give you everything at once. So take the time, build the habits, and then rally the herd is the other part. Find these social circles. circles. We talk about leadership groups. We're reading books. We're great at reading books and distributing information. Have we started a book club? Honest question. Do you have a book club with these coaches? Do you have a group of coaches that you're gonna collaborate with here at this conference that you make a point to call and text every couple hours all right, throughout the conference? Hey, what's going on, what are we doing? Are we finding these like-minded individuals? Are we putting the rotten apples with the rotting apples? Or are we putting the rotting apples with somebody that's pretty pristine and shining and can help that rotting apple get better? Find the herd, find these like-minded individuals that it's important. So maybe we just don't put our incoming freshmen all in the same group with some things. Let's find them a leader, let's guide them, let's inspire them, because we want them. We want a whole herd of elephants going down that field or court. All right, hopefully a little bit more limber, so we'll be in good shape. Once I've shaped the path, once I've warmed up, once I've assessed, now let's get into focus, and this is where we get into the habit change aspect. This is just a snapshot from Steve Olson's, you know, Excel training templates. You know, who's ever gotten Excel eyes once in a while when you're just programming, like excessive amounts at a time, right? You're just looking and then all of a sudden the borders are messed up and everything's just fuzzing, all right? Everything's just an issue. Do you want to be bothered when you're programming? Probably not. You might shut the door, you might put on some headphones, you're like, I'm in the zone right now. So how can we focus on what's important with our athletes with nutrition change? So let's look at it. The success of change. This comes out of uh, The Power of Less by Leo Babauta, another quick, easy book. I highly recommend you read it. We found, working with all the clients that we did, athletes, general pop, if I change one thing, let's talk about success of change. If I change one thing, I've got a success rate of about 80%. Think about that. If I only change one thing in my nutrition program, I add this or I remove this, I drink more water, I get more veggies instead of, you know, au gratin potatoes, I add a post-workout supplement, 80% chance of that sticking. Just one thing. And as soon as I go ahead and add another change, it shrinks all the way down to about 35%. But most of us, were like, all right, you need to do this, you need to do this, coach-centered approach, remember. You, 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 need, 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 should, should, should. Let's add another thing on top of that. New year, new year, all right? New you. Three changes, we're down to almost 5%. So we just asked our athletes to come in, to work hard, to show up on time, to give it all their best, and to work on their nutrition, and go to their study hall, and make sure you get tutoring, and make sure you spend an extra couple minutes, and make sure you're working this job, and make sure you're taking care of this person and supporting this. Lots of changes happening. What's gonna happen? They're gonna get burnt out. So when we're thinking about meal plans, can we take a more sustainable approach? Can we just take it easy? My goal for you at the end of this talk is to figure out what are the top log jams in your way? What's blocking success with your athletes? Is it the environment? Is it the alcohol? Is it the know-how? 
Is it to just, I don't know what's going on or I just don't have great resources around me. So let's work on that slowly and let's check in back in as we move forward. Because what we see with meal plan keywords now, standards, is we things like avoid and limit, all right? Processed sugars, stop eating junk food after seven o'clock, all right? Drink 42 cups of water, can't do this, don't do this, shoot for X amount of pounds, eat X amount of ounces of meat, all right? Work at this, try this. There's a lot of things we're telling our athletes to do, but in reality, this is what we throw at them. All right, so if you're gonna muscle gain, we'll just talk about that. All right, you're probably not eating breakfast, so I want you to eat breakfast. And then obviously if you're not gaining, you ain't eating, right? Gotta get those gains. Eat every three to four hours. You're not doing that, so let's eat every three to four hours. And I notice you're not drinking a post-workout shake, so let's do that. Clearly you're eating junk, so let's eat more real food, all right? You're on the road, so let's add some more snacks. Why not? Eat faster, trick the body, eat as much as you can before 20 minutes, your body doesn't know what's happening, and then you're like, whoa, let's do it. All right, gain parties. People have eating parties, believe it or not, all right? You get in the private sector, you see all these things on Facebook, like they're doing hosting for makeups and this and that. I've seen guys just do straight eat fests, right? Dan John talks about that. Come over, train with me. We'll just throw on some dead animal flesh and lift things and just eat. It's actually a pretty good strategy. Eat pretty quickly. But I want you to eat quickly, I want you to sleep more, and then you know what, it's, it's off season, right? No cardio, no speed, no aerobic, alactic, aerobic work, all that stuff, just do less. And you know what, you're kind of looking a little soft these days, so you're not eating protein, so you gotta do that. Eat more veggies, eat less carbs and fat, eat less junk food, eat to 80% full, because who wants to really be full? This guy over here wants to be about 120% full. We want you to be slow, we want you to be mindful and attentive of, to your eating cues. Uh, obviously you need to sleep more, you're in college, nobody sleeps, and do more, right? You just, just eat less and do more, how easy is that? Okay, that sums up the whole 80 minute presentation, right? We throw all this at them, way too much. Success of change, one thing, what is it again? 80%, think about that. And 80% is a good job. How many times do you tell your kids, you did a good job today, you give them a little slap, nice job. A bunch of good jobs built over time is way better than doing an awesome job once in a while. A B minus effort done daily is way better than an A plus effort done once in a while. So if they're gonna go out there all gas, no brakes and crush it right now, all right, man, let's see you. Let's see how we're doing with this change that we talked about it in 12 more weeks. Continue to do a good job over time. We're gonna be in great shape. Stop doing this. Recommendation. Don't give them a big book. Don't give them a chapter on carbs. Don't give them a chapter on fats. Don't give them a chapter on post-workout nutrition. Don't say, welcome, here you go, let's do this. Take your time. Do things daily, all right? I brought up Dan John earlier. He said, if something is important, let's do it every day. We warm up every day. Some of us foam roll, we do readiness questionnaires. And if it's not important, don't do it. Have you looked back on your programming and maybe the way you lead your staff? You're like, what was I thinking? Who's looked at their first program they ever wrote as a, college, as a strength and conditioning coach? Raise your hands. Who's still doing that, like to the T? Exactly. There's some stuff in there we just put in there because we didn't know what else. Like, ah, I don't know, vertical pull, vertical push. I don't know, I saw this on T Nation. Let me throw this in real quick. My advisor doesn't know what T Nation is. She's not gonna look it up. Sweet, A, right? If it's important, do it every day. When we bring groups in, we talk about culture, we talk about accountability, we talk about building a championship team. What goes into that? We call ourselves performance coaches. Some of us are sports scientists. They use something called the scientific method. There's a lot of things going on. But they're always analyzing, they're observing data, and they're doing things day after day after day. And if it's important, you remind your team why we're doing what we're doing. And throwing in a little nutrition tip once in a while goes a long way. Because if you say it enough times and you repetition it over and over again, it's gonna become ingrained. Just like squatting the parallel, just like catching a clean with the feet underneath the hips, okay? Just like wrapping the thumbs around the bench bar. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Let's take that approach with nutrition and let's see how it goes. As we looked at nutrition, all right, there was a study done in European Journal of Social Psychology, I believe 2009, we get in this habit of like habits. So how long does a habit take to really stick? And there was actually a doctor in the 1950s that you know, was doing some plastic surgery and then he kind of found out that, hey, it took about like 21 days to, I don't know, wow, I'm getting used to the new me right here, okay? And then he kind of took that and kind of brought it to another scope and he kind of found this relationship. It was about 21 days. And that's the issue with research sometimes is 
what's correlated isn't always caused by that. It's not a direct relationship. So they did a study. They looked at 12 weeks of work. They found some habits, okay, excuse me, about 18 days, 18 repetitions. Other habits, 254. They said the average was about 66 days. But it is all context dependent. If it's an easy goal, you need fewest amount of repetitions. Show up on time. That's an easy one. All right? Let's do a little bit more. It's going to take a little bit more. You have something that you want to change. Maybe that's a couple percentage points of body fat. All right? Maybe that's staying after getting that extra work. It's going to take time. And we have to respect the process. Because if we keep our eyes focused on this, what's directly in front of us, we miss peripherally what's happening around us and in the big picture. Does that make sense? We have to take time to slow it down and build these habits. So my challenge to you as coaches when you leave today is, what are these issues that my kids are facing? I remember going to a talk and it was like, yeah, I'm building all these recipes. I had kids that were living off campus that didn't even have pots and pans. And here I was saying, yeah, just get a George Foreman grill. So I literally went to Walmart and the dollar store and built a performance kitchen for under 90 bucks. And I said, guys, this is what this is. This is how you do it. We talk about learning styles. Some of us are about learning by doing. Some of us are rationally thought, left brain, we're gonna read things, we're gonna write notes down. So our handout's getting the job done, all right? Or if you're watching HGTV, which I know some of you are, okay, can we adapt some of those cooking shows? Can we have some fun? Can we build into our team competitions? Hey, we're tracking, are they loafing? Are they running as fast as they can? Did they set a PR? Well, why not build in some camaraderie? Let's get outside the gym. Let's go to our culinary side of school. Let's talk with the chef. Let's get somebody on staff that maybe can get their certification and talk with our kids. So the whole process is if we focus on that and we step outside the box a little bit, we'll get them outside the box of processed foods, but we'll meet them where they're at. We can appreciate what's gonna happen if we take our time with it. So what's one thing that you can do right now? Ask yourself as a coach, even at the conference, what's one thing that you could change come Monday? Or when you're working with your athletes, what's one thing that you can work with we can focus on right now? Is hydration the limiting factor? Is it the supplements? We have this inverse relationship between, oh, you've got to get bigger, so let me just push more, more post-workout supplements. All right? Pushing more supplements is like putting more golden nails in rotten wood. It's going to look nice, it's going to sell nice, and the foundation is just going to go ahead and remove itself. So, at the end of the day, what is your next action? I'm big into next actions. We talk about this, what's gonna happen next? What can you do? How did you like that? What's gonna happen? What's moving forward? What's one thing you can do right now to get closer to that goal? I can do X. Cool, you feel ready about that? Willing, awesome. All right, I want you to check back in with me next week, keep a little habit diary, and we're good to go. Food logs, diet snap, easy. Take a photo, send it, keep track your food for a couple days. You can send the PDF of your food, it's an app. Or the process itself, another app, Happy Scale, you download that. I want to lose 20 pounds. It doesn't say you are 20 pounds away from your goal. It says goal number one, lose two pounds. And when you lose one pound, it says 50% of your goal completed. Awesome. We talk about growing confidence, right? Just like getting under the bar. We get to cluster training, 90%. We might go to four reps or we can just do one and say I want you to do four reps with 30 seconds in between. Grow that confidence. What's one thing that we can work on right now? So two more sections left as we finish up. Now, as we build the habits, we're growing the confidence. Let's talk about systemization. Some of us might use products like Train Heroic. Some of us might use things like Coach Me Plus and Team Builder. We want to systemize things. When you go from being a college coach to a private sector coach, you realize that it has to be repeatable. It has to be sustainable. It has to be moved around in a situation that if you're not there, it'll still run. The gym is still running right now. We don't have discretionary weeks. Do we want to repeat yourselves? How many of us have taken athletes to the grocery store? Raise your hand. Talk about that, nutrition labels and all that. Have you ever been successful with like a group of, I don't know, more than like eight? Have you taken a group of 40 kids there? Why not take a GoPro and go through it and make it the day of a Division I athlete or Division III athlete? And you shoot it, and then maybe you watch that on site. And you bring in somebody that can do that. What type of systems can we build here to streamline the process? Goes back to that big book of things. What are we going to do today? How are we going to accomplish this? What type of system can we build? If we adapt strength coaching to nutrition coaching, this is a little bastardized diagram, but if, let's say we're looking at Alvin Meal's hierarchy of athletic development. On the base, you've got work capacity, and then you've got strength above it. You've got elastic strength, you've got reactive strength, but at the top is speed. 
So let's just say this is a level one, this is a level two, this is a level three type of athlete. We're gonna work on things more towards here. And if you're coaching them, you're gonna focus on progressive overload, you're gonna focus on clusters and complexes maybe, but you're not gonna do clusters and complexes until they've mastered progressive overload. And then maybe you buy Dr. Brian Mann's newest book on velocity-based training, and you're like, heck yeah, I got some Tendos, got some form collars, got some gym awares, now we're getting into this. Are all of your athletes using what's up here? No. Just like all of our athletes shouldn't be doing advanced nutritional strategies. Let's not worry about macro counting and my fitness pals yet. If they're not physique competitors or if they're not weighing or if you're working with like a sport like wrestling, that might be different. But a lot of our athletes are level one. If we're teaching Olympic lifts, we focus on the athletic position first. And then we do the RDL and then we get into the hang clean. So if we can try this to nutrition coach and what would it look like? I wanna build awareness. I wanna educate them. I wanna talk about portion sizing. That's something we have wrong. I'm very fortunate I'm able to travel all over. I've been to China, I've been to Australia, going to Taiwan. Our portions are messed up here, like bad. I was in China with uh, Ron McKeefer and Brian Mann, excuse me, not Brian Mann, Brett Bartholomew, and they got it figured out, man. You just sit at this big table, and it's this lazy Susan style. This Susan was huge, it was like 10 feet. And they just bring out one little thing at a time. They put out the protein first. They put out the veggies first. And they just got purse sliding it. And then you grab it and you converse. Dinner takes like three hours. I lost five pounds that week. Not because it wasn't the food. It was because it just took a long time. So we adapt. Portion sizing. Let's focus on that. That's our athletic position. That's our ground-based progressive overload. Level two clients. Now we start talking about workout nutrition. Don't go right for the post-workout shake. It might help. But let's fix all right, the rotting wood underneath. Maybe we can talk about carb cycling and calorie cycling, but then we start getting into social trade-offs. And then lastly at the top, hey, now we might have to get into some serious precise food logging. Looking at macros, changing percentages of carbs and fats, keeping things like protein relatively the same. We're gonna macro nutrients, all right? We're gonna target that. And then we might do some advanced testing. I'll show you some slides. We do some pretty advanced testing with some of our athletes, but a lot of the athletes that we consult with, they need, they're level one, level two. So with level one strategies, let's talk about that. It's easy, I know most of you have seen this online. A, serving a protein is about a palm. Of serving of veggies is about a fist, of carbs it's a cupped handful, of fat is one. Start with your athletes building portion sizes based around their hands, because guess what? Wherever I go today, guess what I still have? Got my hands. Have you ever been on a date with somebody that's like, oh yeah, can I just get that measured real quick? I actually know a coach who had a date with somebody who brought out her food scale at a really nice New York steakhouse. You think they went on a date again? Yes, well, they were a little desperate, but <laughs> you don't see that often. You don't, you're always gonna have this with you. What is a serving? A serving protein, it's about 40 to 60 grams. Serving carbohydrates, about 40 to 60. Ladies, we would just cut that in half and cut that. So guys would go two palms, two fists, two cupped handfuls, two thumbs of fat, 15 to 25 grams, all right, maybe a quarter cup of almonds. All right, some oil. Ladies, we just cut that in half. We would start there and then we would adjust as needed. They're not gonna bring measuring cups with you. Maybe you are right now. And if you are, I'm not judging because you probably have a big goal coming up, like a show, and this has to be taken care of. You might be measuring your foods. You might be bringing that guy, that Tupperware, to the next talk because you've got something higher level. But our kids, most of them don't have this. One thing to think about too, is food logs. How many of us still do food logs with our athletes? Dietary records, anything like that? Okay, a few of us still, good. We like to focus on what you ate, how much you ate, right? That's pretty much sums it up, that's what the data. What about if we just dug a little bit deeper? What if we looked at, we did something called the Behavior Awareness Journal, and we figured out what their triggers were, what their routines, what their rewards were happening. So pre-workout nutrition, intra-workout, post-workout, whatever it was, maybe it was pre-meal. What are you thinking? What's going on in your head right now? Why are you eating this? What just happened? Maybe you got yelled at. Maybe you failed the test. Maybe we get into the emotional side of eating. But throwing in a little column next to your food log, what's going on right now, maybe that's leaving us clues. How many of us have tried a, ver a version of intermittent fasting by any chance? Raise your hands, okay. For some of us it works, for some of us it doesn't. We go through this giant window of not eating and then we try to rationalize with ourselves, well, I didn't eat for like 16 hours, let's go for it. And then what's so very hard towards the end of that eating window is to shut it off, right? But maybe we just, we're coaching all day, we're doing what we need to do, and we just forget to eat, and all of a sudden we get home and we just crank it up. 
And then we're like, ah, why am I overeating? Well, there's clues. So if we do things like behavior awareness journals, what are you feeling? What's going on here? It's all happening because of something happened during the day. So just build in one little strategy with those food logs. Another one is this will give us, all right, the three C's of change or the three R's. There's a reminder. There's a trigger. There's something happening right now. You're making a decision. Your athletes are making a decision because something caused that. And so by tracking things, when we get to these strategies, we can find out what it is. We get that reminder, and then that shifts us into routine. We wake up, we check our phone. Why do we check our phone? Because there's something at the end right here, there's a reward. Maybe I got a bunch of retweets last night. Maybe I got a bunch of likes. I wake up, I hit my email button. Yes, I was waiting for that one professor to get back to me. Boom, there's a reward. But what happens a lot with our choices with food, especially with athletes, is there's this reward, like post-game meal, and then what happens after that? They're like, ugh. And then you start building in the negative self-talk. Why did I eat that? And then I restrict. And then I binge again. And it goes over and over and over again. So by building in some sort of awareness within our level one athlete, we're in good shape. Why did you miss that weight? I, I just, I didn't get my mind right. I was thinking about this. Okay, notice that, name that. Let's call that out. And let's see how we adapt to that if it happens again. Another one to think about is the athletic performance journal. We talk about readiness questionnaires. What about if we tie that in with nutrition coaching? So hey, let's work on this type of style of eating. Let's figure out that one thing that we're changing. How are you feeling now, okay? How did you sleep last night? How's your mood? How's your energy? How much do you feel like training? What's your physical health like today? I hope many of us have realized that as we get closer to the end of the semester, that's when most athletes are gonna get what? Sick. Things are gonna happen. They're stressed. So is it the optimal time and duration to test them? We may have to because that's what our coach wants, but coach-centered versus athlete-centered. So tie this in with nutrition coaching. Hey, we worked on this habit last week. Have you noticed any changes? Yeah, I actually found out that if I drink something other than Mountain Dew, I feel pretty good, okay? Or if I stop going all right, to the local Taco Bell, even though it's been recently named the healthiest fast food restaurant, you know what? My roommate actually and I get along now. There's always something happening. So let's take pride in the questionnaires. Let's build it in. Everything can kind of be intertwined, concurrent sequencing. We're talking leadership, we're talking nutrition, we're talking making better teammates and better athletes. Let's all tie it in together. Okay, so now that's level one, so let's review level two. So now we get into workout strategies, right? There's a, there's a bunch of great supplement companies out there. Obviously, we're making sure that it's NSF and it's third party tested, right? There's actually some legislation going on right now, college coaches, you might know about it, removing the protein restrictions. That's sweet, because oftentimes, right, the calorie rule with the 30%, now we have to fill it with fillers and all this carbs and extra fat and all of a sudden maybe my weight loss type of athlete doesn't need all those extra calories. So there's some things going on right now. Hopefully we have a decision by the end of the month, but a basic post-workout shake, look for this type of thing, all right? About 15 grams of protein, 30 to 45 grams of carbs, all right? But guess what? We don't need it, but we're going to build that in with our athletes because they probably have to go right to class. But research has shown, and I'll send it to you if you want to get my links at the end, all right? If we just have a post-workout meal, we're in good shape. Have that as soon as possible. But again, we shape the path. So I'll tell my kids at the, at the gym, hey, try to drink a shake within 20, eat within 60. Because they're gonna go with Susie and Taylor and they're gonna go out and they're gonna forget to eat and then they come back four, five, six hours later. But a basic level two workout strategy, okay? What we can't do is give things like this. This is right out of a very popular ebook right now on dieting. Meal one, one to three hours before you work out. Have a split of 75, 45, 18. It's gotta be that. Meal two, I only want you drinking a third of your shake. And then two thirds right after, that's gonna be a bigger split, 150 to 45. Guess what, meal three, again, we're thinking, we're overloading left side of the brain 40 minutes after your workout is over. Another shake, two to four hours, three to five hours, and in case you haven't forgot, you still gotta eat before you go to bed. Wow! But if you're level three and you're working with some high-end athletes that have to make some composition changes, you might need this. But do most of our athletes need this type of structure? No. But some athletes will do well. So if they want some numbers, play with it. But for the most of us, we don't need that. Now, Charlie Francis has been a big influence. I know a lot of my speed training and programming. What if we took his high-low approach with sequencing and the CNS, and we just apply that to calorie load, right? So if we did a high-low approach, and we looked at my high-intensity days, so my lower body days, all right, maybe it's my conditioning days, the days that I'm not doing tempo and extra workouts, I'd simply just ate more. This is a basic level two strategy that we can incorporate. And a simple strategy is like, hey, let's go eight to 12 cupped handfuls. I'm not saying 400 extra grams of carbs, because if you say 400 grams of carbs, they're gonna drink about 17 more shakes. 
right? They're going to go ahead and make value of that Rice Krispie treat. Let's add some more whole foods to this approach. Some of my high days, hey, we're getting after it today, all right? Friday is a pretty tough training day with me because I know you got the weekend to recover if you do it right. So let's add some little carbs right there. Less carbs, that's going to be less calories. If we want some fine tuning, we can accomplish that. So a basic, simple strategy there. Because once you get to level two, you got to start doing food prep. Try doing food prep in the dorm. Right? Then all of a sudden you're on Pinterest, now you're figuring out how to make your own granola recipe. And instead of figuring out what's going on tonight, you're thinking, what can I spiralize right now? This is what happens, we get sucked in. Because you're like, I can't have pasta with my mom, it's homecoming weekend. Can I bring my spiralizer? Do you think Olive Garden's okay with that? Can I get the tour of Italy, but can you just... It takes this for level two. This is what could happen. We don't need to get there for most of us. So let's take the time to establish the base and we'll be in great shape. But hey, if we are working with level three, and if you're at a facility or a university that can accomplish this, there's some awesome stuff we can do some blood testing. So we have a very high level elite testing program at Precision Nutrition. We work with athletes that, are, that just train for Rio, that are getting ready for world championships. Hey, we'll look at their blood testing. We'll send that to our team doctor. We'll see are there some things, are there some flags that we can tweak. We'll do some food allergies and intolerances. Worked with a sprinter, he was having a hard, hard issue recovering. Turns out one of his biggest meals was chickpeas. It was just built into his diet. And guess where his highest allergy was of inflammation? Chickpeas. Cleaned that up, added a new whole food source of carbohydrates, never felt better. Did pretty well for himself. So we've got food allergies and tolerances. Heck, we even got DNA testing now. Look at that. You can't argue with your DNA, right? It's like DNA. So now there's diets for that. So we're not gonna give a diet. But what we can figure out, hey, maybe you have a sensitivity to caffeine we didn't know about. Maybe you do have a gluten intolerance. Hell, I went to the doctor last week. I am now gluten free. And I lost five pounds. Thank you, okay? But was it because it's, gluten's the issue? No, it's probably because I stopped eating crap with my four-year-old son. That simple thing. But some DNA testing can build that in. We can see what type of risks they are for vitamin deficiency, such as vitamin D. All right, as well as some injuries in their omega-3 fat ratios. So there's some cool things we can do with that, but you know, incoming freshmen, probably not. We can study the microbiome, our gut, the relationship between foods and feelings and what's happening in here. All right, we might not be able to just tell our athletes, eat more Greek yogurt, eat more fermented foods. Chances are they probably don't know that, but if you're working high level, this can be a game changer as well. So now we'll start looking at all the different types of bacteria that's going on in their gut. Their top five, how diverse is it? What are some strategies with the food that we can implement? And then lastly, if we're reviewing, we take the time to do things like HRV. Take the time to do catapult and GPS. Maybe we've got an Omega Wave system. What is it giving it? It's giving us data. Dr. Brian Mann's talking about that right now. What is the data showing us? If you are using it and you're measuring it, make sure it's appropriate. So if you're using body weights, look for trends. If you're measuring body fats, look for trends. If you're looking at readiness questionnaires and average scores, Look for the data. It's telling you what could happen. Because if you're writing a cycle out for intensities with weight training, and all of a sudden nobody got faster and nobody got stronger and everybody got hurt, you would change it. Do we want to collect data just for the sake of collecting data? Honestly, no. All right, underpaid, overworked, it's the same story over and over again. But if you're going to take it, use it and take the time to establish that. What is it going to tell you? Is there a trend that you're looking for? Is it hormone levels? Is it optimal times of training? Is it when we're training, when we're eating our pregame meal, when we're not eating? Is it the traveling? Is it the jet lag? What can the data show us as coaches? And then lastly, how is it working for you? Those are the five words, the most powerful besides show me that we can use as strength coaches. It's a review. How did we do? Did we win? Did we lose? Did we get hurt? Did we get stronger? Ask how that's working for you. Yeah, that was a really great habit, coach, but you know, it just didn't work for me. Okay, cool, so now we know something, we can go ahead and tweak this. How can we make this a little bit easier? I should have done that in the first part, all right? So using this model of outcome-based decision-making with this habit-based coaching model, it allows us to see the big picture and do it slowly and do it carefully because what we want at the end is a great product. We want a great person and we want somebody that's gonna go out there and get those results. So simply, are you doing something? Are you strong? Are you fit? Are you lean? Are you fast? No. Do you want to be? I feel like Dom is Eddie up here right now, okay? Do you want to be? No. Then keep doing whatever you're doing. Cool. Are you? Yes. Then keep doing it. No? Yes? Change something. That's all it is. Why aren't we doing that with nutrition coaching? 
and maybe we are, and I don't want to make a gross generalization, but just talking with coaches, especially at the conference already, we're just kind of putting this in the back seat. Let's take the time. It's an extra couple minutes. Let's figure out how that's working for them, okay? We take so much pride in doing an annual plan. We've heard the things of keep it simple, strength coaches. Keep it simple. Do it, do it, do it, do it. But what should we do with nutrition? It's sustainable. Don't give them something that's just all out. Because that's what we expect. That's what their coaches expect at practice. Give them something that they're going to feel confident with, that they can take advantage with, and they can run with it. And then all of a sudden, now you have interaction. Now you have discussion going on. They're foam rolling. They're warming up. Hey, how'd that go? Yeah, I tried that new recipe. Awesome. And again, they're not going to be as excited as you, especially if you're in the nutrition side of things like I am. But it opens up that dialogue, and it continues that repetition model. 18 times, 254 times. Let's meet them where they're at, and let's take care of business. All right? So again, if you didn't get the slides, precisionnutrition.com slash athlete-centered-coaching. My email is right there, adam.fight at precisionnutrition.com. We're out of time, as planned. I'll be here all the way through Sunday. I hope to catch up with you. Thank you so much.